so glad that you are here today. We're so glad that you have come to worship. I think after a day like yesterday, uh, we need to come and uh, to a place where we can find the Lord's presence, and we have already this morning. I want to address some of the events of yesterday because to not do so, I think, would be remiss in my duties and some thoughts that have occurred to me. I think we saw the events yesterday, and we saw the black hand of evil. We saw the enemy rise up. But yesterday we also saw the hand of God, and we saw God intervene, and we saw God raised up because God is in control, not man. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, he said that in the latter days there would be some things that would happen that we need to be aware of. Jesus said, in those last days, many will be offended. That's Matthew 24, 10. Many will be offended. Aren't we living in a day today where everybody seems to get easily offended? Everybody gets upset because somebody said something they didn't like. And so they pick up an offense. And Jesus said the thing that would characterize the hearts in the last day is that they would be easily offended. It goes on to say in verse 10, Jesus said, and here's the result of offended hearts. Now, he, he lists three things. This is not my sermon, but I just have to unload on this. He said there are three things that would happen when hearts are living with offense. He said, number one, he said, and they shall betray one another. And they shall hate one another. And then in verse 12, Jesus said that in the last days, as a result of all of this offense, and because iniquity shall abound, does that describe us? Iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall what? wax cold. Folks, I think today, as I think back over yesterday, yes, the enemy is at work. Yes, we are living in those days Jesus warned us about. And he said this would happen. But I don't think we should be complicit as a church, as a people of God, just to say, well, that's the way it's supposed to be, so that's the way it's going to be. I believe God warned us that this is something that would happen so that when we see it, that we wouldn't fall into complicity and say, oh, well, it's just going to happen, so might as well accept it. No, I think he was warning us and saying, yes, it's going to happen, but that doesn't mean you have to just give in to it. You need to pray against it. You need to come against it in the name of Jesus. You need to say the enemy will not win. This is wickedness, and we as a church of Jesus Christ, we will stand against it in his mighty name. Amen. This is what God is calling us to do. Betrayal, yes, we see it. Hate, my goodness, the vitriol that pours forth from the media the vitriol that pours forth from supposedly grown, mature people, the attacks, it's got to stop. And he said that the, because iniquity would abound, and that's part of this offensive thing, that iniquity is abounding. You can't say anything against iniquity anymore without people getting offended. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that in Jesus' name, sin is still sin. God loves sinners, but folks, he has said there are things that should not be, that should not characterize, especially the household of God. And so he says, the love of many shall wax cold. If there is one place where the love of God ought to be just flowing, it's in a room like this. It's in the churches across America. It's from the pulpits of America. The pulpits need to be the conscience of America, preaching the Word of God because only the Word of God has the power to change hearts and minds. And if we don't get a heart change, a mind change, we're going to have Problems like we've never seen. Our nation has come close several times to this point. I can still remember where I was and what I was doing when I heard that our former president, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. I remember that. I remember where I was when I heard that Martin Luther King, Jr. was assassinated in Memphis. I can still remember when Robert Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles. I can still remember when Reagan was shot. But I want you to know, we as a nation, we survived because in those days, we did have a generation that held up the standard of righteousness, that prayed to God on their knees. They heard from heaven, and heaven answered their prayers. We were able to survive that time. If we're going to survive the coming days, it will take the same thing. This is a new generation. Rise up and walk in the steps of your forefathers and claim the heritage of God that he has left for us. One of the ladies of our church, she was upstairs ironing when God spoke to her as clearly she says as she's ever heard God speak before the shots rang out she was told pray for President Trump pray for Trump she began to pray and within just a few minutes an attempt was made on his life folks we need to hear the voice of God. Amen. God, I believe, spoke to a lot of people across this country, not just here at First Baptist in London, but across the country he spoke to open hearts, open minds, willing spirits. They heard God say, pray. With that, I feel that we need to pray. And I want to do that right now. I don't want to just talk about it. I want to do it. I believe this is a call for prayer. And I believe if this nation is to have good days ahead, it will be because of good people, people who are praying, people who will not let the darkness win. And we are to be salt and what? Light. Let that light shine. God, we're praying for revival. So with that said, I'm going to ask that we all stand. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and pray. And, and I do want to say this. If you want to come and gather across the front and you want to kneel up here, please feel free to do so. But let's all pray. Let's bow our heads. Let's seek the favor of heaven. And let's pray for healing. Because he is the great healer, and we need healing. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, how yesterday was such an emotional day. How it was a day, Father, when we felt, we felt the presence of evil as shots rang out as one dear man was killed, as two others wounded, as our president was wounded. Lord, we, we saw all of this. We watched it unfold. But yet, 
as they were trying to describe it, they said it was a miraculous moment when he turned his head just at the right time. Lord, we don't believe in serendipitous moments. We don't believe in luck. We believe that you, and by your mighty hand, you raise up leaders and you take down leaders. I do not know the future that you have for this man. I do not know whether he will occupy the White House again or not. Lord, that's your business. But you told us to pray for those in authority over us and to pray for peace that we might be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in an atmosphere of peace. But, Lord, if peace does not come, we will still proclaim the gospel because it is still your word. And you have placed your power in your word, and miracles still happen when we believe your word. Father, our nation needs to turn back to you. And we know that there has been so much darkness that has been let in and has taken over. But Lord, I still believe. I still believe that the remnant who love you with all of their hearts, the remnant who believe you, the remnant who call upon you, Lord, I still believe that a people who do call upon you, that Father God, you will hear and answer from heaven. You will heal their land. And you will turn the hearts back to you. So, Father, we, as your children, living at this time in this world, Father, we say, first of all, examine our own hearts to make sure there is no bitterness, that there is no thing that would defile in our lives so that we can pray, be clean vessels through whom the Holy Spirit can work. Oh, Father, today we pray for renewal. We pray for revival. We pray for redemption of hearts and souls. We pray for our leaders. We pray protection. But most of all, we pray that they will be hearing the truth and responding to that truth. Father, today we love you. And you are the world's only hope. And even though we may be living in the last days, Father, our job is not finished. May we be found faithful to the last moment, the last day, the last second, that we will continue to let the light of love shine as the antidote to the darkness and the hatred that is trying to engulf our world. And we're going to believe you and we're looking forward to that day when the shout is given, the trump of God shall sound, and we shall all be gathered home with you. Lord, what a glorious day that will be. And until then, we've got a job to do, and may we be found faithful when that trumpet sounds. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I know many of you feel the way I feel, and I know that many of you carry the burdens the same as the rest of us, but isn't it good to know that together, together we make a powerful force for God? I want you to open your Bibles, if you would please, to where we left off last Sunday. I gave you all a homework assignment for last Sunday, and we are going through studying chapter by chapter, in some ways verse by verse, through the book of Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. This was a church he had established. He had been with them for about 18 months. He had taught them many things. And you'll remember that they were a troubled church. They had problems. And Paul was trying to correct some of the problems, and he was also trying to answer some very important questions, questions that are not unrelatable to us today. And the question we're dealing with, and we have been dealing with here, especially in chapter 8, 9, and 10, is the question of how much liberty do I have as a child of God? How much 
liberty do I have to do certain things? How much liberty do I have since I'm saved and born again and I am not under the law anymore? How much liberty do I have in the things of living life? How about my hair? How about my dress? How about, you know, how things look? Can I go here and do that? Can I eat this? Can I drink that? Can I, you know, those, all of those questions are applicable in this passage because what Paul was dealing with was a group of believers who were saying, we have knowledge that an idol is nothing. So therefore, we can go down to the pagan temple, eat at the Zeus restaurant, and have a little Aphrodite sauce on the side, and it doesn't mean a thing because Zeus doesn't exist, Aphrodite doesn't exist, and I can sit here and eat, and it doesn't bother me, my conscience at all. Paul says, wait a minute, you're missing something. You might have knowledge and you might have this sense of freedom, but you're not as smart as you think you are because you're not applying an overarching principle. And that overarching principle is this. Am I operating out of love? What about my brother who has come out of this pagan background and he sees me down there participating in the pagan restaurant eating food that's been offered to an idol will it create a problem for him what about my testimony will it create a problem there so Paul is saying look love has to take precedent over your freedom oh I can do that it doesn't bother me yes but it does bother others where do we balance this out at now Paul gives two examples of why we need to be careful in our associations. He uses the association with Christians at the communion table, and then he uses the association of the Israelites at the altars of God. And he says, notice what's happening. And so you remember that the pagans of that day were very polytheistic. They had many gods. They were also what you might call polydemonistic, uh, polydemonistic. They believed demons were everywhere. They believed that demons were always trying to enter into our bodies, and they said that they believed, this is not true, but they believed that demons jumped on food, and when you ate the food, you were ingesting demonic. So what the pagans believe, if I take my steaks and my ham or whatever I'm eating and I offer it to the gods first, the gods will be so happy about that, they'll blow the demons off of it like flies off of meat. So then it's clean to eat. That's how their mind went. And so Christians were saying, well, look, I can go down here. I can get on the stool, snuggle up to this guy, and I can witness to him while I'm eating the same meat he is. Paul says, yeah, you might have the freedom to do that, but is that the best choice? Is that the best thing to do? So these are some of the things that Paul is dealing with here. And then he uses this example. He says, <clears throat> don't you understand that when you go to the feast with the pagans that you are participating in their worship experience he says don't you see that when you participate in their worship experience they think you are in agreement with them and he, he adds this little zinger in there Paul says wait a minute you need to get a hold of another thought here and that little zinger was this don't you know that when you go to the pagan restaurant and you ate the meat that was offered to a pagan, yes, that pagan god is nothing. But there's something behind the pagan god. Now let me ask you all this. What's behind the pagan god? Tell me. 
demons. That's what exactly what Paul says. And I want you to look at verse, uh, if you look at verse 20. He said, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participating with demons. So what he's saying here is that the demonic attaches itself to certain things like these gods that are worshipped. And as a result, I don't want you participating with demons. You may be doing it thinking you're free, but you're in your ignorance. You don't know what you're doing. And you're damaging your testimony and you're damaging your weaker brother. You're damaging those people who have just got saved. They came out of paganism and they see you down there at the place they left. Do you care about them? Do you love them? So that's what Paul is dealing with here. And he uses the example that I think is so good as communion. And this is something very important. He says, now you remember, he says that when you participate with the cup of communion, are you not all becoming one? Are you not identifying with him? Let's look at, he says at verse 16. Everybody, chapter 10, verse 16. He said, the cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, there are many in one body, but we all partake of one loaf of bread. He said this bread, and by the way, the bread that they used in communion was about as big as a platter, as thick as your thumb, and they would pass it around and it would be peace would be broken off everybody's participating in the one bread and therefore Paul says are we not all one body this represents the body of Christ he's going to make an illustration here he says don't you know when you participate at the table down at the pagan temple and you're eating that bread and meat down there you're participating with pagan worship. You're provoking God to jealousy because God doesn't want to share worship of himself with anything or anybody else. He says, get this in your head. You're associating with the demonic. Listen, I want to tell you something. I've had personal experience with items and objects that have been used in worship, not of God, but in other gods. And I want you to know that those objects carry spiritual power, negative spiritual power, dark spiritual power. I could tell you story after story of people who have brought into their homes things that they've gotten maybe in their world travels that have been dedicated to some spirit or some God, and they don't realize that when they bring that into their home, they are creating problems for themselves and their children. And I've had people ask me to come and bless their home and pray over their home. I'm glad to do that. I had a couple who was sick all the time. They were fighting one illness after the other, and there was disharmony in the home. They said, would you come and bless our house? We just think, we need a blessing. I said, sure, I'll be happy to come. And I remember sitting in their driveway before I went in, I prayed, Holy Spirit, give me spiritual eyes to see exactly what the problem is. Let me see it. I knocked on the door, they opened the door, they were glad to receive me, and I hadn't been in that house five seconds and I saw exactly what the problem was. I could see the stuff they had that had been dedicated to spirits. They did not know. They did not understand. They were spiritually ignorant. Good people, but spiritually ignorant. 
And I remember trying to tell them they had to get rid of this stuff. And would you believe that they told me it costs too much. We can't throw it away. And I said to them, then I can't help you. I can't bless what God has cursed. And it was true. I remember as I was leaving, they asked me the question, you think it's okay then if we just give all this to our daughter? I said, why would you do that? Do you hate her that much? I can think of missionaries who brought back items, again, unknowingly, things that had been used in pagan worship, and it caused so much problems until it was broken and gotten rid of in the name of Jesus. So, folks, let me tell you, you may think some things are innocent. These Corinthians thought going down to the pagan restaurant and eating Ah, these pagan gods are nothing. They don't even exist. I'm a Christian. I can stand against this. And they were foolish. And Paul says, you're not operating out of love. Listen, if we don't operate out of love, we have no spiritual power. If you do not... Paul said, if I don't have love, I'm what? I'm, I'm just a noisemaker. I'm like a sounding, what, brass, tinkling cymbal? He said, I'm just making racket. And I just wonder how many pulpits are just making racket. Making racket because there's no real love there. And so that's what Paul is trying to get these folks to see. And he says, when you come to communion, you have fellowship. Look at verse 16 again. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation? That word participation means koinonia in the Greek. It means a fellowship with, a participation in. He says, when we take communion, we are fellowshipping with God, and we're fellowshipping with one another. Koinonia. He says, the bread. We participate with God. That's his broken body for our transgressions, for our healing. <clears throat> he says, where are you coming from? Don't you understand that you're participating with God, you're participating with one another in the name of Jesus, and when you go down to the pagan restaurant, you're participating with a lost crowd that don't know God, and they think you as a Christian are evidently approving of their worship. He says, you've got to be careful here. He says, you're, you're also your younger brother who just came out of that stuff. He still struggles with it. A participation. And he also gave the example of Israel that when they brought their offerings to God... When they brought their offerings to God, it was divided up into three sections. One section for the priest, one section for themselves to take home, and one section was offered up to God. He says, you're participating. They participated with God through their offerings. He says, don't you know that when you take the offerings of the pagans, you're participating with their God? And then he says in verse 16 he says the cup of blessing that we bless is it not participation in the blood of Christ okay that's a rhetorical question it means what yes now I want to this is a little technical and I just want to take a little bit of time to deal with this but uh, you remember the early Christians they would have a get together and they would call it an agape feast, a love feast. And then after the love feast, they would have communion. Their love feast, the agape feast, was kind of a, what we would call a potluck. And uh, <clears throat> they would all get together and they would all share. And then they would take communion. Now, our communion is based off what Christ taught us. And he taught it 
to his disciples in the upper room before he was crucified. And he was taking the Passover meal, the Seder, and he was going to transform that Seder into something more than just the Jewish notion of the Passover. Since Paul is a rabbi and he's talking to mostly Jewish converts, they understand what he's saying when he says the cup of blessing. Now, what you may not know, and I'm just going to do this real quick, is that in the pa Passover Seder there were four, four cups. The four cups were this. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. To be sanctified by God means to be set apart for his special dealings and blessings. Sanctification is, comes from the root word that we translate holy, H-O-L-Y. And so the first cup, as the children of Israel were getting ready to leave, God said, sanctify yourself. So that meant to go through cleansing, go through a point here where you give yourself totally to God. Jesus took and drank from that cup. And then you come to cup number two, which is the cup of plagues. The cup of plagues. That's the uh, second cup. And the cup of plagues is remembering the plagues that God sent on Egypt to bring them out. But the second cup also represents something else. Not only the cup of plagues, but it also represents the cup of healing. Why do I say that? Because in Psalm 105, 37, it says, And he brought them forth with silver and gold, and there was not one sick person among all their tribes. So the cup was praising God for all of these plagues, but it didn't come on them. And they all, when they participated in Passover, not only were they spared the death angel, but it was in that commemoration that they were all healed. Every Jew was healed because he had put the blood on his doorpost and the lentils. Not only was he spared the death angel, but when he left Egypt, he was healed. There was not a single sick person among them. Listen, let me just say this, and I've had this happen. When you participate in communion, and you remember the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. Remember how Isaiah put it. Isaiah says, and he was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. And by his stripes we are what? Tell me. It's an interesting Hebrew word there for healed. It carries the idea of physical healing. We have seen people healed as they partook of communion, as they prayed and thanked God for his shed blood and broken body, and they lifted up their own body before the Lord and asked God to heal. We have seen people healed. So when you take communion, don't think of it as a funeral dirge and get all set. Think of it as a time of rejoicing because Christ, when he died on that cross, shed his blood, his body was broken. Think of it as a time of redemption and rejoicing and celebrating. And think of the power that that means. It's not just something we do. There is purpose and there is power. Believe God. Believe God. So that's the second cup. The third cup, this is the cup of blessing. When Paul was saying, and the cup of blessing, he was talking about that third cup. Jesus lifted up the cup, the third cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. When you hear those words, remember, this is the third cup. Therefore, there, this is the third this was the cup of blessing. This meant that as a result of his death on the cross, we are rejoicing in the fact that we have a home where? Where's our home? Heaven. It made it possible 
by the sacrifice of Christ. That is a blessing. Folks, how many of you know that when all of your sins were forgiven, that was a big, big blessing? No longer under condemnation. No longer carrying the burden of guilt and sin. Why? Because the cup of blessing, the redemptive act of Christ on the cross. That was the third one. Now, Jesus said something interesting. After he, they had taken the third cup, he said something very prophetic. Now, you notice he did not celebrate the fourth cup. He did not celebrate the fourth cup. What is the fourth cup? The fourth cup was the cup of praise. The cup of praise. I want you to think about this. Jesus said <clears throat> in Matthew and in Mark, he said, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until when? Until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. One translation which I like says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day comes when we drink it together in the kingdom realm of my Father. Now let me just kind of pull all this together. In that fourth cup, Jesus said, we're not going to drink that now. We're going to drink the fourth cup later. Did you know in Jewish weddings... Get this, this is beautiful. In Jewish weddings, the bridegroom under the canopy, which represents the glory of God, the bridegroom would take a cup of wine. He would hand it to his bride. And when the bride took that cup and she drinks from it, folks, get this, this is a sign of her acceptance of the covenant being offered, and her acceptance of the cup seals the marriage. This fourth cup is called the Kaddush in Jewish weddings. And when he hands that to her, and she takes that, and she drinks from it, she is saying, I accept this covenant relationship. This is our relationship from now on. Jesus said, there's a marriage supper coming. Get it? There's a marriage supper coming. The Bible says that on a certain day, God the Father is going to say to his son, go get your bride. Mm. Go get your bride. The trumpet of God's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive are going to be transformed, renewed, just totally transformed. We're caught up together to meet him in the air. And then we have this seven-year wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper. Well, who's getting married? Who's the bride? We are. Who's the groom? Jesus. He says, when we get there in the marriage supper, then we're going to have the fourth cup. We're going to have the Kaddush. You're going to take that fourth cup. I'm going to give it to you, and we're going to drink together in my Father's house. And I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until we all get together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Take a drink. Seals the deal as it were as it were. We're actually sealing the deal that has already been made. But it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And Paul is saying, let me just wrap this up here. Paul is saying, don't you see that when you take the cup and eat the bread, you're participating, you're fellowshipping with God Almighty, and you're fellowshipping with other believers because you're all drinking the same cup, you're all drinking, eating the same loaf. He says, don't you see, let logic lead you, don't you see that when you participate in the food that has been offered to the idol, you are in koinonia, you are in fellowship with the fallen. He says, think about that. 
Think about that. And let that guide your decisions. Now, you say, well, how does that apply to us today? Folks, there's a lot of things you and I might have the freedom to do. Places to go, things we can do, things we can imbibe of, things that we can eat, things that we can drink. But the thing that we need to let guide us is, is it going to be helpful? Is it going to be a blessing to me? Is it going to be a blessing to others? And so I, I give you these last three principles. Number one, when you're trying to decide whether something that is gray, I should do it or not do it, ask yourself three questions. Number one, does it help me? Does it help me? If it doesn't help you, leave it alone. Don't do it. Number two is the test of authority. Am I going to control it or is it going to control me? So I can do that, yeah, but you might fall under the control of something you didn't really aim to let control you. In other words, who's going to be in control? Who's going to be in control? Me or that? Now, I can eat a ton of donuts. Boy, can I. I walk by every morning, and these guys that are sitting out here have boxes of donuts, and I think they're just tempting me all the time. Just look at it. Pastor, you want a donut? My flesh says what? Yes. Oh, man. Make that a double. <laughs> my doctor says, and I can hear those words in my ear, don't do that. That's not good for you. That's going to cause you problems. Now, am I free to do it? Sure I am. I could eat it. Nobody think a thing about it. But the next time I took my sugar numbers, they would be, and I want to be around for my grandchildren. Does that make sense? So I'm free, but is it the best thing? Do I control it or does it control me? If it's starting to control you and if you're taking something to self-medicate your pain, then that thing is in control of you. You're not in control of it. And anything that is controlling you other than the Holy Spirit is going to be a major spiritual problem for you, if not physical. It's going to damage your testimony. And then number three, I close with this one, is the test of charity, the test of love. All things are lawful for me, they were saying. Paul was quoting them. Yes, that's true. But are you being motivated by your liberty, which really turns into license, or am I going to be motivated by love? Because here's brother so-and-so. He just, he has a problem with this, and he's come out of that, and he's a new believer, and he's trying to get ahead. But am I going to be dragging him back into bondage? Am I, do I love him enough to say, hey, cool, we just don't go there. We just don't do that. Why? Because I want him to grow, and I don't want to be a stumbling block to him. So, for, so let me just ask you this question, child of God, and I preach to Christians here primarily on Sunday morning. Can you? Yes. Should you? Let love guide you. Let wisdom guide you. And I believe if you'll put Christ first and the love of your brothers right behind that, you will always make the right choice. And then I think you'll be happier for doing so. Let's pray. Father, as we come to the close of our service today, it's been good. We've worshipped you this morning with some wonderful worship songs, music that has just uh, blessed our hearts in so many ways. We thank you for this dear couple that have come to lead us in worship today. Lord, we have been blessed by the spirit that is upon them. Father, I pray that today that each person here is being led by your spirit and is seeking to do things out of love to help build up one another. 
Father, we thank you that there's a day coming, a day coming when we will be able to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when you speak to your bride and all of us pick up the cup and together, together, we take that covenant vow, we drink it together new in the Father's house. What a joy. Father, for someone here today who doesn't know Christ, my, I hope and pray that today's the day when they say, yes, yes, I want that. I want Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. I want a new life. Lord, I pray that they'll come today because we have folks here who will pray with them and help them find the greatest meaning of life at all. And Father, for some today that just need to pray, they've got burdens, Father, that they just cannot get out from under. I just pray that you will help them to see that you're there with them. And as we said last week, you will not allow anything to be placed on them that is beyond the ability to bear it. But will, with those trials, make a way of escape. Thank you, Jesus. May folks today do business with you and make eternal decisions, for we ask it in Jesus' mighty name.